Okay, so we're going to get started and uh, we'll go over the residential purchase contract um, to give you guys some more insight. Um, if you guys have any questions, let me know. Um, just to keep you guys informed, um, don't get too comfortable. Uh, the RPA is being changed. Uh, we are going to be from, go from 10 pages to 16 pages. Uh, that's going to be effective at the end of the year. So just so you guys know, um, what we will be changing. <laughs> so that is crazy. I know. <laughs> so, um, but for now, uh, we still have a, you know, till the end of the year. So we still have a little bit of time. So I want to make sure I know you guys are out there writing offers to, um, to definitely make sure you guys are all um, have, you know, know what exactly what it is you're signing. So, um, there are also additional disclosures that are attached to the RPA um, when you when you sign them. We're, we're not going to get into those today. We're just going to basically go straight into the RPA. So this is where we begin when you see your California purchase contract. So when you're preparing your offer, the day prepared is obviously the day that you're writing the offer. Okay, so you're going to put in that date. Dates are always important on contracts. So you're going to input the date. Uh, this is an offer from. It's always important to ask your clients, you know, their, their legal names, you know, because again, remember when they sign loan documents or, you know, anything they usually need um, their ID in order to get the documents memorized. So you don't want to have um, issues later on having to, you know, change it or not even that, but you don't want to send it to your client and then tell you, well, that's not how my name is spelled or, or, um, you know, or they go buy something different. So you always want to ask them, you know, um, what is your legal name and, and, you know, how do you want it to appear on your contract? So definitely have that conversation with your buyer. Um, the real <laughs> property. Is, uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, the real property to be acquired is, you know, obviously the, the, the home address. Now, when I start an offer, just so you guys know, if you guys are familiar with MLS Connect, if you notice it's here, um, filling it out. So if you click MLS Connect, what's going to happen is you can put in the MLS ID here and you select find. And when you find it, it's going to show you the information here. And then that way it auto populates. So once you confirm, yes, it is one, two, three, Apple Street, you're going to select emails. You're able to import the tax ID number and a lot of the different um, things that need to be imported. So now, excuse me, can you ask everybody to mute them? I'm just going to make sure everybody's muted. I apologize. Just just so that way, because it's kind of getting noisy. Um, okay, so um, that is one of the better ways. I, I loved when they came out with that MLS Connect because it's actually one of the better ways to import and it gives you you know, the, the seller's uh, broker information, the agent, the licensing numbers and all that stuff. So that way you don't have to go in and type it and find the information because you want to fill out that contract as best as possible, especially right now, these buyers or I'm sorry, these sellers agents, you know, they don't want to have to do anything. So if, if your contract is half full, you know, they're they're probably going to skip it. So so anyhow, so that would be an easy way to to auto populate address, parcel number, um, and all of the uh, the seller information. The next thing you want to input, obviously, is a dollar amount. So that's the amount that your client is offering. And then escrow shall close on what day? Now, if you have a specific date that they need to close May 15th, that has to be May 15th, then you can indicate that right here by simply clicking that and typing in the day here. Or you can go here and put 30 days, 25 days, 45 days, whatever it is. So it's either or, it's not both, okay? So again, once you come down here, this should already be filled out. And if you have templates, it should already be filled out as well. And that'll be another class if you don't have templates. So coming down here, initial deposit. This is the deposit that you've advised your clients that they need to give in good faith. This is their deposit that, that is required to be delivered within three business days um, once the offer has been accepted. So remember that 
sometimes it can be countered out. The, the seller might say, I want it within 24 hours. So just make sure that you um, understand that. So, and remember it's business days. It's not calendar days, business days, Monday through Friday. Okay. Calendar days is every day of the week. So here, if I put my initial deposit is $10,000, this is where I'm going to put it. And here, if you notice, you can say how it's going to be transferred. Now, if you notice the default is transferred directly to escrow by electronic transfer. So wires is always uh, a default. Okay. Because that's the most common now. So that's why it's a default. If you check nothing else. Now, if you want to, if you know you're dealing with someone who possibly might want to write a personal check, then you have to mark personal check. I know that there are uh, agents and there are escrows that won't accept a personal check if that was not approved by the seller. So remember that needs to be marked if that is important to you. If it's not, then you can leave it unmarked. Okay, so then we'll come down here. Now also the buyer may do an increased deposit. Okay, so if they do an increased deposit, that's like, let's just say for instance, I'll give you an example. When I've done an increased deposit in the past, it's been when my client has a 401k. So right now all they have is 5,000, but they wanna put 15,000 as a good faith deposit. But because the 401k is gonna take them, let's just say 72 hours to five days or whatever it is to receive, then they don't have that money as of yet. So you can put that within the amount of days they'll it'll be deposited. So and within five days after acceptance, you know, they'll send in another $5,000. Let's just say, you know, whatever it is in the event you need to use that, um, that. Um, I, it is for the EMD, it is business days. Yeah, it's business days. And it does in, say that on here as well. I know it does. Yeah, within three business days, right there. Sorry, ah, right there. Okay, so again, that's if you wanna do the increased deposit. That would be one reason uh, why you would, would do that. Um, the other thing is, is if you are dealing with an all cash buyer, lucky you, <laughs> and if you are, then you're gonna select all cash there. Uh, because obviously it's going to take away anything having to do with the financing. Now, just because you have an all cash offer, it doesn't exclude appraisal. It only excludes financing contingency because obviously there's none, but it does not remove appraisal contingency. So keep that in mind. And then here, if you don't have the um, proof of verification of funds, then that's when you're going to mark here that within three days, you're going to give the uh, verification, which nowadays you need to give verification when you submit your offer. Um, so that this honestly would not be a good box to mark um, unless your client just, you know, just does not have it. But again, I don't know that the agents are willing to, you know, view it without that. So in the event you do have a loan, it's always defaulted to conventional financing. So if you're conventional financing, you would not mark anything. But if you have an FHA buyer, then you're gonna uh, click FHA. And if you notice it actually defaults you, um, it, it'll auto-populate the FHA and VA addendum. Um, that's in regards to the appraised value. So it'll default that for you. Um, if your client is VA, it'll also again auto-populate and default that form for you. Uh, so you would mark there. Now, if the seller is financing, and that does happen sometimes, then you're going to select seller financing. And then obviously that's going to auto-populate the SFA for you. So, or if there's assumed financing, and I know those aren't very common, but they're there for a reason in, in the event you need them. Um, and here is where you're going to put your loan amount. So if my first loan amount, let me go back here really quick and just put in a price. So if I do... 500,000, just so it doesn't look funky. I'll put that I'm putting 50% um, down. So, or I'm not sorry, not 50, 10% uh, down. So here, my loan amount is 450. So let's just say I am going FHA. And now I don't know about some of you guys, but if you, not everybody puts this loan shall be at a fixed rate, not to exceed. And then there's a blank spot right there. Um, the purpose of that is actually to protect your client. 
Um, so let's just say, for instance, the loan officer says right now rates are 3%. So you're like, okay, well, they only qualify even at three and a quarter. They, if, they, if the rates were to get to three and a half, my client's not going to qualify. So by you putting this three and a quarter here, in the event the rate that's offered to your client is higher than that, then they actually can cancel without any penalty because, again, the seller agreed that if they received an offer that's higher than that, then they would not be able to, to close this transaction. So not very many agents put that in there, um, but I have had agents in the past tell me, I need you to put an amount in there. I have seen that. So it just depends. Um, here you can write adjustable rate if it's adjustable. And then the rate, again, same, not to exceed what would be the highest. And then regardless of loan type, buyer shall pay not to exceed. So if they're paying any points, again, typically we don't really fill those in because lending changes and and, and that can change anything. So um, here is if they have a second loan. So if there's a second loan, like let's say they're doing Cal Halfa and they're getting a 2% you know, second loan, then you can put that here and you would put it under other. And then you can just put you know, Cal Halfa uh, here. And then you would put the 2%, let's just say it's 9,000 that they're getting, you know, they're getting back. So you can do that as well. If in the event there is a second loan, you should be disclosing it that way. I know a lot of agents don't disclose it and you don't even know it's down payment assistance until you know, you're doing a cross qualification, but that's where you would indicate if there is secondary financing or if they're doing a 90 uh, first and a 10% second. Um, so there's, there's just different options for second loans. Now, additional financing terms, this here is where you usually mark if you want your clients, um, if they need help with closing costs, which we know right now that's really not an option, but here is where you would put, you know, seller to assist buyer with, you know, 3% towards, you know, closing costs. Or... So that's where you would indicate that because financing should all stay in one place. So that way, when we review it, we know where they're, you know, where they're asking for the closing costs. Okay, so let's see. Let me go to answer some of these questions. Okay, Sonia, what is the point of an appraisal if they are buying cash? Well, it's just really up to the buyer. Sometimes the buyers still want to know, even though they're paying cash, they want to make sure that the value's there. So it's just really up to, it's not that it has to meet an appraisal, but there's some cash buyers that will still want an appraisal done. So it's just an option. You have to make sure that you, you ask them that. Um, I have a question regarding appraisal on cash purchase. Do you have to let them know about half? You're supposed to, okay, wait. Okay, so Alia, your first question uh, regarding cash, appraisal on cash purchase. Wait, I'm lost. Is, yes, is that Sonia. Okay, yeah, okay, so <laughs> since um, the appraisal is usually scheduled uh, from the lender, so how do you schedule an appraisal? I mean, you just do it directly through an appraiser? Yes. You know? yes. So you, yeah, you get in touch with an appraiser. I actually have a relationship with two appraisers that do that for me um, on the out. Like they don't go through banks though. You can call them and they'll go out and do an appraisal for you. And then they give that to the, the client. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And you know what, to be honest, it's a 50, 50. I have some cash buyers where they're like, just give me a CMA. I'm good with that. And then I have others that do, in fact, want it. So it just really depends on that buyer. And then what is your question about CalHAFA? Oh, yes. If it has to be disclosed in that section, because I've done I've done it a couple of times and I don't ever remember put it in the contract. So my question is, like, do we have to disclose that? Yes. because And the reason why, I mean, a lot of people don't do it just because they don't know um, but the, the right way would be to disclose up front. So that way, because it has to make sense when I'm putting this, you're putting a story together of how this person's going to obtain financing. So when I'm looking at your approval, I'm going to look for proof of funds. I'm going to be looking for those things. Um, and obviously they're not going to be there because they're getting this assistance. So if, in order for your contract, you know, for them to say it's, it's valid, you, you have to disclose to the seller what type of financing you're obtaining because they, they are, you know, they, they have to agree to it. And in this current market, do you see any of those offers getting accepted? Uh, I have seen, it just depends on the home. It really does. I really think that, I mean, it's right now, it's a really different market. You have agents who, 
don't, you know, who don't really care necessarily so much about the financing. They want to deal with an agent that's, you know, they can reach, they want to deal with someone who can close the deal. Um, but then you have others that are just looking for who has the most money, who can, you know, net the most money and do, you know, do those things. So it just really is up to the agent. You have to talk to the agent and see where they are with what they're looking at. Cause I've talked to agents that are like, Nope, won't even look at it. And then you have others that, you know what, I'm open to everything. And as long as it makes sense and I see that it's well put together and I'm going to be able to get this, the, the bottom line is I want to get it closed. Right. Okay. So, Thank you. You're welcome. So Terry, along with the changes a lender experiences, can't the percentage also change in D1 as well? I don't understand why the rate would be locked in so early. Yes, it can change. That's why you put it higher. So like, let's just say, for instance, if your, your lender saying more than likely they're going to get 3%. So you can put three and a quarter. It ultimately what it does is it protects your client. It's okay. not that it can be higher if you're okay with it, but I it see. protects them in the event. Like, let's just say, at, like you're saying at the end of the deal, you know, here that they decide to lock just before docs and now they're at mm -hmm. 3.75. They don't qualify anymore. Well, guess what? Now you can say, you know what? We can't close this deal anymore. So we need to opt out because, you know, based on that, it can't exceed that. Okay. Now I yeah. understand the protection. Great. Yes. Thank it's you more so much, to Sonia. protect your client. Yeah. You're welcome. Perfect. Yes. I like that. I never, yes. I never knew that, but I will yes. do that from now on. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. You're welcome. Okay. So now going down here, FHA or VA. So for any FHA or VA loan specified in 3D1, which again, that's if you're doing FHA or VA, buyer has 17 days after acceptance to deliver written notice, which is that form that's automatically um, populated of any lender required repairs or costs that buyer requests seller to pay for um, or otherwise correct. Seller has no obligation to pay or satisfy lender requirements unless agreed in writing. Um, but the FHA VA a mandatory clause shall be a part of this agreement. Now, for those of you, when an appraisal is completed, and let's just say the appraiser calls out, you know, a roof certification or a water heater being strapped or, you know, anything that they call out as repairs needed on an appraisal you will attach the form FVA because those are lender required. They're not just the buyer asking. These are actual lender required repairs in order for this loan to fund. So know the difference. And again, we'll get into that you know, in more detail at another time, but just wanted to let you guys know for clarification. That's why it's important to fill out the FHA VA, a mandatory clause form of when you um, when you fill this contract out and when you send it with your offer, it's all included. So they understand that there could be lender required repairs. So down here, F um, goes to, uh, it'll, it'll, it does it for you, which is nice when you're putting in your, your sales price and then your loan amount, it does all the calculations for you. So this would be the balance of their down payment only. And then the total again of the price that they're actually paying. Okay, so then we're gonna go on to page two. Uh, verification of down payment and closing costs. So this right here, typically on our contracts, we have verification attached because we do usually send uh, proof of funds. So that way they know that they're able to close the deal. And then appraisal contingency and removal. Again, this is again, this agreement is not, if it's not contingent upon you um, appraising um, or you have 17 days from acceptance to, um, you know, remove your appraisal contingency or what most buyers are doing right now is, you know, lowering the time as well. So just up to you if you want to put, you know, seven days or if you want to remove it all together, whichever you, you know, you're most comfortable with. Uh, loan terms, loan applications within three days or you can change it. Um, you have to have a loan application. But again, most buyers are already pre-approved. So you're just going to click letter is attached because you should be attaching their pre-approval letter um, to, you know, to show their, um, their qualifications. And then we go down to loan contingency. So buyers shall act diligently and in good faith to obtain the designated loan. And that's the loan that they said on page one. Okay, so buyer's qualification um, for the loan specified is a contingency of this agreement, unless otherwise agreed in writing. 
if there's no appraisal um, contingency or the appraisal contingency has been waived or removed, then failure of the property to appraise at the purchase price does not entail buyer to execute their cancellation right um, pursuant to the loan contingency if buyer otherwise qualified for the specified loan. Buyer's contractual obligations regarding deposit, balance of down payment, and closing costs are not contingencies of this agreement. So make sure you understand what a loan contingency is and what it is in place. So when you remove your appraisal contingency, even if the home does not, you know, um, appraise and you need to come in with 50,000, then you should have, you know, that 50,000. And what I tell listing agents is, you know, if you, if you're taking an offer from someone who says, I'll pay you, you know, 40,000 above appraised value, then you need to verify at that point, they have the 40,000, because if they don't, there's, you know, they're wasting obviously everybody's time. So you want to verify that, you know, on the other end as well. Um, here is where you would mark no loan contingency. So you would mark if you don't have any, and again, that's, that's pretty steep to do. So you want to make sure that, you know, you're, you're making sure you know you're doing that um, with your buyer's acknowledgement and sale of buyer's property. This here is marked only when the buyer is you know selling their home and they have to close in order to purchase. So you would attach the COP to the RPA. Um, and here are the addenda and advisories. These are additional addendums and advisories, and there's also room for other and other terms. So you can always add. So backup addendum, if for whatever reason, you know, you're doing up your, you are a backup offer, a septic, well, you know, short sale, court confirmation, if there's any addendums, you know, statewide buyer, REO advisory. So whatever it is, is you're going to make sure that you um, indicate that on here. And then other terms would be, let's just say they're solar, you know, you can put, you know, buyer to assume solar, um, you know, once, you know, uh, the contracts reviewed. Uh, a lot of times I like to put on here if there's if it's a pool home, you know, pool to be because um, you'll be surprised delivered in in same condition because some people just stop maintaining stuff, you know, um, all personal property and debris to be removed, you know, so because again, people unfortunately even though it's there and they should know um, it's not there. So you can, you know, add anything more specific to it um, that you feel that, you know, regarding that particular home, that would be your place to write that. Um, and the allocation of costs here, dependent upon right now, we have some buyers who are willing to pay all the seller's costs right now because of what's going on. But typically you would mark seller, you know, to pay for the natural hazard because it is, um, it is required by law. And then you can select the provider here or whoever it is you want to write. Um, if you do want a termite, then you would put here uh, termite um, inspection and section one clearance. And you can even put um, section one clearance up to $1,000 or up to $500, or you could always do anything like that, uh, especially right now, if you feel you're trying to be a little bit more competitive, you can do that as well. Okay, and then if there's any other um, reports that you want, you would mark there. Um, here is the government requirements and retrofit. So here you would mark seller. So seller shall pay for smoke detectors, carbon monoxide, install water heater bracing. Um, and that's, this is what's required by law and, and by, you know, where we do real estate. Every area is different and what's required. Um, but for us out here, this is based the bare minimum that needs to be done. So definitely mark, you know, buyer or seller, uh, just depending upon, you know, how you're negotiating. But that definitely is something that we usually put seller. Now, um, B, 2I and II, uh, sell, sell, buyer or seller shall pay the cost of compliance with any other min, min, minimum or mandatory government inspection. And if required as a condition of closing escrow under any law, um, two uh, buyer sellers shall pay the cost of compliance with any other mandatory government retrofit standards as required as a condition of closing escrow um, under any law, whether the work is required to be completed before or after close of escrow. 
So just so you guys know, we typically don't mark, we leave those as a, as a listing agent. You definitely don't want to accept an offer with the two I and I, I marked. You don't because basically the sellers already agreeing to fix anything that needs to be done. Now they have no idea how much it is. So instead of agreeing to it up front blindly, uh, we prefer as listing agents to keep it um, blank or removed from the contract. And we rather negotiate it if that were to come up, if there's anything that is government, you know, inspection or re retrofit standards that is required. So the seller can have the option and not be obligated. Now, as a buyer, you can choose to market um, and then it'll be up to the listing agent if it's something that they are familiar with or not. So that would be up to you. Um, but like I said, typically as a seller's agent, you want to make sure that those are not marked when you receive an offer. And if they are, you want to remove them from your contract. Because basically, like I said, what it does is it puts your seller um, in a spot where they have to, they've already agreed to comply with anything that's needed. So whether, you know, it could be something that's, you know, $200, it could be something that's $5,000, you know, it just depends. So definitely want to make sure um, when you're filling that part out. Uh, escrow and title. So here, uh, you know, obviously, usually everyone pays half and half. So, you know, 50-50 each to pay their own fees. Um, that's typically how it's written. But again, right now in the market we're in, you can have, if, if, the, if your buyer's willing to pay for everything, then you'll just take that out and you'll just mark buyer. So that way buyer is paying for all the escrow fees. Um, and same thing here with title insurance. Same thing, seller is typically the one who pays for it, um, but you can you know, choose to ha ask the, uh, have the buyer pay for it if that's something they want to do. And as a buyer's agent, you know, typically services are choice of the, um, the selling agent. So you can put a seller's choice here. If, you, if you're trying to limit a counter altogether, then always just put seller's choice. So that way you don't have to um, worry about them countering you back. You don't want to counter. You want them to take the offer and not have to counter. That, that's the whole goal um, for when you're writing the offer anyways. And then typically you have a county transfer tax or city transfer tax. Now every city is different. Most of the cities in the Inland Empire do not have city transfer tax, um, but everyone does have county. Um, but I know when you're getting into LA, every city is specific. Um, so if you're not sure, just mark it just to be, uh, you know, safe. And then in regards to homeowners association, same thing, make sure that you're marking these because if you're not, and they're, it, your home ends up being in an association, the, um, the seller is, is going to obviously tell you to pay for, you know, those fees. And, um, so if you continue to go down here again, you can add anything else, seller or buyer to pay for. I know some of you guys do admin fees. So down here would be, you know, your, your admin fee and then who it's payable to um, and then, the, or your TC fee or whatever. And I know most of them do 650. So this is just to show you, this is kind of how you would write it out. Um, so that way the buyer knows they have to pay that. And then down here is the home warranty. And a lot of people don't realize, but the home warranty, you know, they, the escrow does have to abide by the contract. So it's important that it's accurate. So if the buyer's paying for it, or if you're asking the seller to pay for it, you know, how much are you, you know, do you want them to pay? Let's just say 650, you want air conditioning, you want it upgraded. Um, maybe you want the 13 month policy that's, um, you know, with platinum protection, let's just say. So make sure you write everything in there as you want it. So that way they can make sure that it is, um, you know, you are in compliance and it is correct. If the buyer is waiving the home warranty and they're willing to buy it later or they just don't want it at all, that's when you would mark this one. And you make sure you mark that because by the buyer signing it, they are acknowledging that they are waiving it. Now, this is always an interesting part here. Uh, items included in and excluded from sale. Uh, it's super important to always, especially as a listing agent, to always ask your sellers, you know, is there anything that you're going to, you plan to take with you right now? I've seen, you know, speakers, um, there's, you know, uh, there's so much technology, Alexa's, um, you know, there's a lot of different technology things that are, people are buying. The ring doorbells are huge. 
Uh, so just make sure that you're having that conversation with your, if you're a listing agent with your seller, what are you leaving? What are you not leaving? Um, this way you can, you know, definitely make sure that when you do a counter offer, you are letting them know. But as a buyer's agent, if you're walking through that house and you see certain things as well, then you can also, um, put, you know, the following items to be included. That way there's no, um, you know, there's no discrepancy later because we do see things, um, you know, getting changed and stuff like that. So you want to make sure that doesn't happen. So you can put, you know, the ring doorbell. Um, I don't know if there's, let's just say it has a pool. So maybe the pool um, cleaning equipment or, you know, anything else that you can think of. But when you're walking around and you, your client, if your client asks you and says, is that part of the sale? You make sure you write it in there and you let them know, I'm not sure, but we'll negotiate it. You know, we'll find out if it is or not. And definitely make sure you mark stove because if you don't mark it, they have the right to take it. So don't assume that if it's in the MLS, that means it stays. It does not. The MLS does not make it stay. You need it in writing. This is your contract is what you have to back you up. So make sure that you, you mark everything as you need it in here. If you want to ask for the fridge, if you want to ask for the washer and dryer, um, or whatever it is that you want to ask for. Okay. Um, I've had where I had a client who redid their kitchen and they took all their old kitchen cabinets, put them in the garage. And um, so the, he, you know, they're attached to the wall. And I told him, you know, are you planning on taking those cabinets? And he said, no, but they're mine anyways. I said, no, they are yours right now. But the minute I put this live and don't say they're not going to be part of it, then, you know, obviously, you know, you're going to have to, you're going to have to leave them if someone, you know, if, 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 you know, obviously if you get an offer. So anyhow, he said, oh, I don't, I'm not going to take them. I, I don't want them. It's going to be too much hassle. Okay, that's fine. Well, then we're midway through escrow. And he's like, I want to take my cabinets after all. And so it's just, like I said, th thankfully the buyers were a little bit disappointed. They were like, oh, well, it was nice storage and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, they were actually were okay with us renegotiating that part. But that's why I just tell you, just make sure you do it up front. And, you know, that way you don't have, you don't have to run into those issues. Um, but uh, leased or leaned items and systems, sellers shall within the time specified disclose to the buyer and any if any item or system is leased um, or not owned by the seller. So that would be like the alarm system. Um, that would be solar, like we mentioned, uh, water filters, uh, anything like that. You know, anything that they've leased to you know enhance their home, but they don't. They're not the current owner, so they have to disclose what it is that they're going to do. Are they going to have it removed or are they um, going to have the buyer assume that responsibility? So it's just important, you know, for you to know that and um, items excluded from sale. So this would be, let's just say, for instance, um, you know, you already knew because on the MLS, it said something was excluded. You can write it in here. Just again, you, you want to just say, you know what, tell it just so you know that you had that conversation with your buyers just so you know, that is not, you know, that chandelier, they already told us it's not going to be included in the sale, um, just so that they're going to replace it with something else. So you can write that in here. So that way, later on, again, your buyer doesn't say, oh, I don't remember you telling me that, you know, and then it's no, it's here. We, we talked about it. And you know, you did. So um, brackets attached to walls. Uh, floors or ceilings for any uh, such component furniture item shall remain with property. Um, or will be removed and holes or other damage shall be repaired, but not painted. So if you don't mark this, this form right here, or this box right here, then what happens is they, if, if they, um, if they remove something from the wall, um, then they, they, I mean, they should. And believe me, we, we do to, I know I tell my clients all the time, don't leave holes in the walls, you know, putty them up. It doesn't have to look perfect, but you know, you, you just don't want all these holes in the walls. Um, but they typically, if, if you're not specific, they, they don't have to paint it and they'll leave it like that. So you just want to make sure that if they tell you, oh, we're not leaving any of the, we're taking the TVs and the brackets. Okay, that's fine. So then you're going to X that and make sure that if they remove them, then they, the damage shall be repaired. It doesn't have to be painted, but you want it to be repaired. Um, and then next, moving on, closing and possession. 
a buyer intends to occupy the property or if they do not intend, then you're going to mark that they don't intend. Uh, seller occupied or vacant property. So, you know, obviously it's different if it's a seller or if the home, there's nobody there, then possessions shall be delivered at 6 p.m. Either on the, if you don't do anything with this, then it's at the close of escrow at 6 p.m. But if you know, again, you're trying not to get a counter. Remember, that's the whole key in our market right now. So if on the MLS, it says, you know, subject to my seller finding a home or my seller needs 15 days or whatever the case is, or if you've called the agent and said, you know, what is your seller looking for? And they'll tell you, you know what, they're looking for someone who's able to rent back to them for 30 days or whatever. And again, if your buyer is comfortable with that, then at that point, you can do that here. Okay. So you can put on here, okay, we'll give them 15 days after the close of escrow you know, at 5 p.m. And then that's where you would give them, you know, their time. And then obviously you're going to attach the, the SIP. You definitely want to attach the SIP. And then because the seller will be remaining in possession after the close of escrow. And so you want to make sure that they are, your, your buyers are protected with the SIP. So then that's when you are going to include the SIP as part of the contract, Okay. And if it is more than 30 days, you're going to actually not include the SIP, you'll include the RLAS. So those are different, um, different forms. Okay. And again, we'll, we'll go into that at another time. Uh, the tenant occupied property property shall be vacant at least five days. So this is when there's tenants in the, um, in the, in the home. When there's tenants in the home, you definitely want that home vacated unless you've agreed to, um, you know, to take the tenants with the sale. So, but if you haven't, you want to make sure that you're able to go in there and, um, and verify that the property is in fact vacant. Okay. And, uh, or that's why I said, if tenants to remain in possession, then you'll include the TIP form. Sonia, can I ask a question? Yes. Did you see the email from... Well, no, I, I'm sorry. I don't think it was email from our legal department, but I know Johnny put something in our message, messenger on Facebook that what is starting to happen are sellers are taking advantage of the law and they're remaining in their properties even after escrow, even if there was never an agreement for the owner to remain uh, for a certain number of days after escrow. But a lot of owners are staying because they've gotten the money and of course, these are only the ones that their intent is to subvert the law. Right. So they're getting their, their money from the sale of their property and they're not leaving. And knowing that in the state of California, they're protected under this moratorium and you can't force them to move. So yes. one of the things that Johnny suggested was to um, manage that at this point, making sure that we perhaps his suggestion was, was including an addendum to make sure that the seller will not get all of their funds until they have left, whatever the agreement is. Correct. Um, you know, my opinion on that is, is definitely, you gotta, you know, you gotta protect, you know, your buyers, you know, absolutely. Um, if, if, if let's just say like to me, if they want to stay under, you know, 10, 15 days, I'm okay with that. Um, but if they decide, cause there, there are some that want to stay 90 days, you know, they, they, they want to locate a property, but they want to do it with, you know, their timing, they want to do certain things. And you know what, to me, that's absolutely okay. But when you're going to become a tenant, when you're, when you're getting into the RLAS form, when you're, you're now legally a tenant of mine, then, then I have to see it from a landlord perspective. So I'm going to need your driver's license. I'm going to need your, um, like you're saying, I'll hold a portion of your money and I'm going to definitely need a rental application. You see what I'm saying? Because I want to make sure, I want to know who it is I'm, I'm renting to basically. Right. So if they're not willing to do that, that's a red flag. That's a good point. That's a real good point. Yeah. yeah I like so, that. You, so, and, and then talk to your buyers and, you know, cause ultimately it's their decision. You know, if, if in the event this would happen, this is what has to happen. You know, are you okay with that? You know, knock on wood, we haven't had yeah. that happen, but it, it it is definitely a possibility, you know, and that's why just making sure that we're guiding and educating. And I typically um, have the, when it, even if it's my seller, 
I, I don't know my seller that well. I can't, I can't vouch for them. So I tell them the same thing. You know what? You're going to have to leave a deposit in escrow and you're going to have to, um, you know, you're going to have to provide this documentation because now, you know, you're now their tenant. So they're like, oh, okay, no problem. We'll do whatever we need to do. So it's really up to the agent to be that professional and educate their client on what has to happen. I think if we all work together, um, then there shouldn't be any, you know, or there shouldn't, there should limit the amount of issues, I should say. So, Great. Um, yeah. so that, yeah, I would just be more cautious. Very true. Yeah. But yeah, Thank it is you. a scary thing. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. So the statutory um, and other disclosures. So this, this here is for, you know, for the agents that are listing agents right now, especially um, you should be filling out all of your seller's disclosures at the time of listing, because that is how fast your home is being sold. And you want to be able to provide those disclosures to your, to your, um, you know, to the buyer's agent as soon as escrow opens. That way you can shorten their contingency periods. Because remember, if you shorten their contingency period to five days, but you don't give them anything within those five days, well, you know, then basically their contingency is, a. Uh, is actually longer by default because you know you as a listing agent didn't do your job. So make sure that you are completing your disclosures, you know, at the time um, of you know your your listing appointment, and uh, and you guys should all have the checklist um, that Remax has in regards to what is legally required, which is basically you know your SBQ, your TDS. Um, gosh, I don't have them all in front of me, but you, you know, all of those that are required. So just make sure that they're, um, they're completing those to the best of their ability. Um, so you have those all at hand, um, because you have to, within the time specified in paragraph 14a, which we'll get to, um, you will have to, you know, give them those forms, uh, to make sure that they have a, a adequate time to review them. And then down here, it says, in the event the seller or seller's brokerage firm prior to close of escrow becomes aware of other adverse con conditions affecting, then you can also, um, you need to let them know. Like, let's just say, you know, when they filled it out that night, everything was fine. And then all of a sudden, now their whole electrical went out on one side of the house, you know, or something like that happened, or there was a flood in the home then you, you definitely need to let them know, oh, we know we have to add this to the SBQ, you know, addendum to it, um, letting you guys know this just took place, but this is how we fixed it, or this is how it was handled. Okay. And then um, natural and environmental hazard disclosures and booklets. Now those back in the day, you know, we used to have to purchase those. Now they're online. You should have your, your uh, TC should have a link uh, and, and be able to forward that to your clients, just letting them know um, regarding the uh, earthquake hazard booklet and your natural hazard um, report should come directly from whatever company you order it from. And all those things could be ordered, like I mentioned, at the time of listing. Um, so that way you have all of your reports and disclosures ready to go. Um, withholding of taxes within the specified um, time, again, in 14A, to avoid withholding, seller shall deliver to buyer a qualified substitute or an affidavit su su uh, sufficient to comply with the federal FERPTA. Now that's another form we'll get into, um, and that's a form that is not filled out com accurately by most agents. Um, they don't fill it out right, but we'll we'll get into that another time. Um, Megan's Law Database Disclosure. Um, there is a website, so typically what I'll do is I will circle that on the contract, and I'll let them know they have the right to go to that website in order to determine, you know, if there's any registered sex offenders, you know, in the in their in their area, and if that's you know concerning to them. And then notice uh, regarding gas and hazardous liquid transmission pipelines. This also could be something that, you know, some people don't want to live near. So again, there is another um, website here that I would circle for them. Oops. Um, just to let them know they can go here and uh, they'll be able to see if they are, the home is also located, you know, in or anywhere near those hazardous uh, pipelines. Now, F, condominium planned development disclosures. 
Um, the seller, again, has seven days um, unless otherwise negotiated after acceptance to disclose if the property is a condominium or located in a, in a PUD, which, again, you guys should know that. You know, you should know that, you know, when you write the offer, but in the event you didn't, um, they have to let you know, you know, within that, that time allotted. And if the property is a condominium or is located in a PUD um, or common interest subdivision, you know, seller has three days after acceptance to request from the HOA. So they have to get on that HOA as soon as possible, um, because that way it gives you guys the right, you know, to review everything. And again, remember that if they tell you, oh, you have five days to remove your inspection contingencies, well, guess what? You know, if it takes HOAs two weeks to get it to you, they just bought you two weeks for your inspection. So a lot of times that really doesn't, you know, scare me when when agents say, oh, you have to do, you know, your inspections in five days. Okay, that's fine, because the likelihood of them doing what they need to do is not very likely. Um, condition of property. This is where a lot of people get confused as well. And this is when I'm talking to my clients, I let them know every home is sold as is because you get agents that say the home sold as is. You're like, yeah, I know that. Every home is sold as is, the way it looks, the way it's maintained, everything, the, just the way you see it. Now, again, the buyer doesn't know what they don't know. So when we're walking through a home, if we see that the carpet is stained and it's torn and it's gross, well, we know that. And it's being sold the way it looks, um, unless obviously otherwise agreed. But what we don't know is behind that wall, there is, you know, uh, mold. We don't know that. So we're buying it as is subject to our inspections. And that's why those investigations are extremely important. So just make sure you let your buyers know that, you know, we strongly advise that you do a each and any inspection that you feel is important to you. I've had where buyers will hire, you know, just a, a general home inspector, home inspector goes and does their thing. And if they feel that there's something that needs additional attention, then they'll say, you know what, I recommend you gain a roof out here because I see water stains in the attic or something. Um, and then obviously you go and you, you go and get a roofer. Don't ever just say, oh, he's recommending that, but no big deal. No, go and get that roofer. And the reason I tell you that is it's better for your client to know what they're buying than for them to say later, our roof is caving in or it's leaking now. And we didn't know the inspector said to call a roofer, but we didn't know it was that bad. And so it, the, again, the liability lies back on us as agents. So make sure if you're hiring just a general inspector and they say, I recommend a plumber come out here. I recommend an HVAC person come out here, whatever it is that you get those people out there unless your client says no. So you make sure you let them know, you know, let's get a roofer out there. Let's a licensed roofer. Okay. Licensed people. You want to make sure they go out there, they investigate, they give you, you know, what in, in fact is the, you know, could be wrong or what the, you know, more or less what the amount is going to be to fix it. And that way at that time, if they say, you know what, it's just a couple of shingles that need to be changed, you know, it's going to cost you $200. Your buyer's like, okay, that's great. No problem. Move on. Uh, it's better to do it that way than to not know. Don't be afraid of the investigation period. That, that period is, it is definitely a breaking point. Um, but it's an important period because how you handle that could be, you know, how, what's going to happen after they move in. So you just want to make sure that you guys are definitely, you know, covered on that part. But again, the, if you have the conversation with your clients and you let them know that the home is sold as is, you have a right to ask for whatever you want, but it doesn't mean that they have to do it. So have that conversation well, well before they're even in escrow. So they, you already plant that seed. I have a question, so, Sonia. Yeah. Uh, that's a really good point. And, uh, and, and that happens quite often. You know, I've seen that, that uh, there is a suggestion on the home inspection report. Uh, what if you're, if you're, so you have the conversation with your client and your client says, you know, no, that's okay. And to other things that you think, well, I would, if I, if I were you, um, should we have that in writing somewhere that they have declined to, to, you know, go that extra mile and hire the, you know, professional plumber or professional electrician to come out and do for their, you know, do some additional diligence on face on the buyer's part? 
if they don't want it, then obviously you've done your part by telling them if, okay. you know, cause some people are just like, I'm handy or my brother-in-law knows what to do. I'm not worried about it, you know, but if they, if that's what they're saying, I mean, the best thing you can do is just have them initial um, the, the home inspection report where it says just so that way, you know, okay. you, you remember, cause you know, if yeah. something's going to happen, sometimes it doesn't happen till three or four or five years when they're calling you back. And then you're like, I don't remember, you know? So here, if you have them initially, it's like, okay, by initialing it, we discussed it. Yes. You know, we, we went over this and you chose not to. So, um, but yeah, no, I, I mean, you right now, legally, nothing's required for you to do extra. Um, but I think for your own sake, um, you know, do whatever you feel that you'll remember when, if that were to ever come up again, just so you know, you had that conversation. But I always highly recommend, I tell them, even if you don't plan to do it, let's just get someone just to make sure. So just so that way, you know, you know what you're buying. That's, that's really all it is. And they're usually like, well, does it cost me? Cause that's the most important thing. Um, but um, some things, some do, and some don't, I know we get roofers, they don't charge uh, our HVAC people. They do charge, but, but usually the HVAC also includes the cleaning. So you're getting your unit, you know, cleaned, which most people never get their units cleaned. So you're getting the cleaning with it, you know, and they're going to, you know, definitely, you know, inspect it as well. So you're getting, you know, two things for the price of one. So, but, um, but a lot of times that you can get some people out there that won't, that won't charge you. So in case that's the, the issue, I have other clients who don't hire a general inspector and they hire an inspector for each thing. So they'll hire a licensed plumber. They'll hire like a fire sprinkler person. They'll hire, um, you know, HVAC, uh, you know, uh, just, uh, 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 electrician, like you name it, they, they hire different people. If there's a pool, they'll hire a pool person. They want specialists in each department. They don't just want a general inspection. So like I said, everybody's different, but they have that opportunity as well. So you let, always make sure you let them know, you know, what do they want to do? Because that's the whole thing later on down the line. I didn't know I could do that. That's, that's what they can say. So you want to make sure that they are aware that they can hire anybody that they please and they feel necessary in order to, um, you know, to satisfy themselves on the condition of the property. All right. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, so the next thing here, and obviously the seller has to make the property available for the buyer. We know that. And um, the, pro the buyer in indemnifies the seller. So this is just letting the buyer know that anyone you hire is your responsibility. It's not the responsibility of the seller. So, you know, God forbid something happens. That's why we hire licensed people because they're licensed and insured. If they fall at that person's house, then they're insured. You see what I'm saying? So they, they can't go after the owner because the owner didn't hire them. So that's basically what that says. Um, title investing. Um, within, you know, the time specified again in paragraph 14, buyer shall be provided a current uh, title report. Uh, the title report is, um, it's only an offer by the title insurance insurer to issue a policy of insurance. So um, obviously we all know what a prelim is and we can get more into that, you know, at a later time, but basically that is something that they definitely need. So we always order title as well when listing is taken, because if we know that it, you know, it can take up to a week, sometimes longer, because if there are issues on that title, you know, it takes longer for them to research. So definitely want to have enough time so that way they understand um, and they have the information in front of them. So they'll, they'll be aware if there's any, you know, any encumbrances, easements, anything on their CCNRs, because even though you're not in an HOA, there are some homes that still have CCNRs. So you're not paying, you know, that homeowner association to have, you know, other benefits, you know, in the community, but there were um, the CCNRs that have been recorded and are made part of that property. So if there are any, you want to make sure that, you know, your buyer is, you know, that you're passing those on to the buyer as well, so they can read them. Okay. And uh, let's see, at the close of escrow, buyers shall receive a grant deed, which we know that um, buyers shall receive the homeowner's policy, which once it closes, that's what title does is issues you that title policy. Um, going down now to 14 time periods, removal of contingencies and cancellation rights. So so these are your time periods. So the seller has seven days after acceptance to deliver to buyer all reports. Okay, so again, seven days, or you can um, you can negotiate that. 
Um, and then the buyer has 17 days after acceptance. Now, in the event you cut down the, buy, the seller's time to five days and you're 10 days, and on day nine, the um, listing agent sends you the NHD report, well, now you add additional five days to that. It's upon delivery. So you can add five additional days. So that's why I'm telling you that you need to make sure as, a, especially as a listing agent, that you are on top of your, you know, disclosures and your reports, because you don't want those days to be extended, um, you know, by, you know, due to your being at your fault. So want to make sure that, so um, within the time specified in 14B, uh, this is just make it so okay, there we go. Sorry, because <laughs> it gets loud. And I have, uh, I don't know what it is that I have, but I'll start getting off task. <laughs> um, so here the, so the, by the end of the time specified in 14B1, which is here, um, the buyer shall deliver to seller um, the removal of the contingency, or if you need an extension, then you can send an extension. Okay, you can always, you know, do a continuation of contingency because you don't have everything. So remember, if you don't get what you need, make sure that you send that extension because you want to let them know that you need that. And then um, also you have, you know, that's your time to also... Um, Sorry about that. Okay, that's your time to also request any, you know, repairs as well to start negotiating if there's any repairs that you, you in fact do want to ask. Now, when you submit your offer and you are removing contingencies with your offer, this is where you would mark. So you're going to mark C here. Removal of contingencies with offer. Buyer removes the contingency specified in the attached contingency removal. So if you are removing contingencies, I and I am seeing appraisals, I, I am seeing inspections. Um, so I'm seeing those. So if you are, this is where you would mark that and also attach the CR. Uh, seller right to cancel. Now, just to clear up anything, a seller has no right to cancel a contract once they're in contract unless they have a contingency. Now, if there's no contingency in place, a seller cannot cancel as long as the buyer is doing what they're supposed to be doing. Now, if the buyer does not um, perform, then the seller has the right to issue a notice to perform and go from there. And seller right to cancel buyer contract obligation. So seller has to first deliver a notice to perform and say why they're not performing. And they, if they don't perform by that specified time in the agreement, then and buyer does not do what they need to do, then at that point, the seller can issue the cancellation. Okay, so notice to cancel. So here is the notice to buyer or seller to perform. So you as a buyer's agent, if you wanted to, you could even change that to three days. If you're a listing agent, you could change to one day. Whatever you feel, or you could leave it as two. It is a default of two days after delivery okay and the effect of buyer's removal of contingencies if buyer removes in writing any contingency or cancellation right unless otherwise specified in writing buyer shall conclusively be deemed to have completed all investigation review reports so basically they've done everything that they needed to be sure that they were okay with removing those contingencies Close of escrow, but before buyer or seller may cancel this agreement for failure or other party to close escrow pursuant to this agreement, buyer or seller must deliver to the party a demand to close escrow. So the demand to close escrow, um, it needs to be signed by obviously the buyer or seller and given to the party at least three days after delivery of close of escrow. So that's like, let's just say for instance, they're just holding up escrow for whatever reason, um, because sometimes that happens, then you make sure that you send a demand to close escrow, okay? Um, effective cancellation of deposits. Now, we already know that buyer and seller have to agree, have to agree. It's mutual instructions. It doesn't matter if they put on an addendum. You know, buyer doesn't have to sign off. No, that's not true. Escrow will not accept that. The buyer has to sign the cancellation, and so does the seller. So you can't just go off that. So 
in the event you guys don't agree, then you got to go to court. Um, and that is typically why I keep my deposits under $10,000 because I can still go to small claims. The minute you go to 11,000, you cannot go to small claims unless you want to lose a thousand because you can only go up to 10,000 in small claims court. Uh, final verification of condition. Buyer and seller shall have the right to make a final verification of property within five days, or you can change that prior to close of escrow. Now, to keep in mind, a final verification is not a contingency of sale. Of sale, It's to confirm that the property was maintained pursuant to the contract and also any repairs that have been completed were done. So it's not, well, if I don't, I'm not happy with it, then this is how it goes. That's why I tell, depending upon the uh, type of repairs, I that's how I'll negotiate it. Because remember, a seller is going to sometimes do things half fast because they just want out. So sometimes it's better to get the repair money so your clients can do the work themselves and they can, you know, hire who they want to do it opposed to, you know, okay, fix those repair. I mean, depending on what it is, if it's minor stuff, okay, no big deal. But sometimes when it gets to be bigger things, it's probably better the buyer handle it once they, you know, have possession and they can do it on their own time. So that's the repairs. Repairs shall be completed, obviously, prior to verification, unless, again, you, you agreed otherwise, Okay, and also, um, just so you guys know this, um, you also here it says provide copies of invoices and pay receipts and statements to buyer prior to final verification of condition. So if any repairs were done, you have the right to ask for copies of who did it because you want to know who did it. Um, I have seen in some counters where the seller will say seller will not be providing copies of invoices or paid receipts. Um, on any repairs done. I do see some agents writing that. So just keep an eye out for that because that is something that you can ask for if they don't counter that out. Prorations of property taxes and other items. So obviously you know what proration means. You only pay what, you know, from the day that you take, you know, take ownership of the home. So depending upon if you're an HOA, taxes, any special assessments, anything like that, that is actually um, prorated. Uh, broker's compensation. So for the most part, um, we are paid through the seller. So, but it just lets them know that the compensation, you know, is obviously it's payable upon the close of escrow. Um, if escrow does not close as otherwise specified, it's agreement um, between buyer um, between buyer and seller. So again, you obviously we only get paid once the the deal closes, unless the seller avoids it from closing for being you know ridiculous. Then there's something different there. Um, and then it goes into the scope of duty, what our duty is, okay? So it's really important that you understand that scope of duty um, because that is where, you know, some agents sometimes tend to cross the line. So make sure you understand that and read that well. It's not that you have to explain it to your clients, but just so you know what your obligations are as a realtor. Uh, representative capacity, um, this form, this is also a RCSD, is another form in the event that your uh, client cannot sign and they either have a power of attorney, it's in a trust or something like that, then this, um, this form would be attached as well. Um, 20 joint escrow instructions um, to escrow holder. And basically this is just for escrow um, and it just lets them know what they need to be looking at um, in order to determine, you know, what all the, the facts and the terms and everything are. So just saying that a copy of this agreement is uh, delivered to escrow within three days, but we try to do it ASAP, right? Um, and then remedies for breach of contract. This here is just letting you guys know that in this is mandatory for the buyer and seller to sign. You definitely want both parties to sign this. Um, and this is just saying any clause added by the party specifying a remedy, such as a release of forfeiture of deposit or making deposit not refundable for failure um, of buyer to complete the purchase in violation of this agreement shall be deemed invalid unless the clause independently satisfies the statutory liquidated damages required set forth in civil code. So again, remember, you can't add any clause. Like I was saying, you can't add anything um, and, unless they're in direct violation of what is in this contract. You cannot do that. It's not there. It's not going to be valid. Um, liquidated damages, and this is just saying if the buyer fails to complete this purchase because of their default, 
And basically what happens is that, that, and I tell them, cause my clients sometimes are like scared to, you know, initial that. And I just let them know that's only if once, you know, you waived all contingencies and then you just decide, I just don't want it anymore. Then at that point you've wasted everybody's time. So the seller has a right to keep your deposit. So just make sure that they understand that there's a difference between, you know, doing your inspections and having that time to do your due diligence and just be negligent and just saying, I just don't want it, you know, for no particular reason. Uh, mediation. So um, all parties have to mediate first. There's no other way around it. Parties need to mediate first and, and hoping we can come to an agreement without, you know, um, going any further. Now, in the event um, they, they can't, we can't, you know, come to an agreement, you know, I'm talking to the other agent and we can't see eye to eye and it's just not going to happen. Then depending upon if they initial down here, um, would be if they go to arbitration. And basically what arbitration is, is it is number one, it's uh, less expensive than going to actual court. Number two, it's faster than going to actual court. But the only thing about arbitration is the arbitrator's decision is final. There's no appealing. You can't, you know, try to do anything or anything. It's, it, it is what it is. So, um, and an arbitrator is someone who was an attorney um, who, you know, worked um, as a broker, maybe at one point, or may, may even have been um, a judge, like they, they can have, they have different backgrounds, um, but they all do have, um, they should all have residential real estate law experience. Um, but you're basically in a room and he's hearing both sides and then he'll decide. And like I said, it can't be appealed. Um, but I have seen, even though both parties agreed to arbitration, I still have seen it taken to court. So sometimes I'm not sure that this is even written 100% in stone. Um, but I do like to tell my clients that um, just the difference between arbitration and going to court, you know, the, the, the differences as far as cost, um, time, and energy, is it worth it? Um, okay, so then let's see. So down here, where we go down, it says selection of service providers. This here, brokers do not guarantee the performance. So of course, we let them know that we don't guarantee anyone's services. So it's important for them to pick, you know, um, anybody that they choose if they don't have any, um, like, let's just say roofers or uh, inspectors or whatever, then you can give them different names or they can Google or Yelp um, different people. Um, obviously multiple listing surfaces. This is just letting them know that we're authorized to report everything that's going on in the MLS. Attorney fees in the event there is any type of action that arises out of this, the person who loses pays all attorney fees. Um, assignment buyer shall not assign any part of their interest in this agreement without having obtained the separate writer relief buyer or buyer's obligation pursuant to this um, in writing by seller. So there isn't a form. So a buyer can initially start this, um, you know, this contract and then assign it to someone else. They, you just can't do that. Um, equal housing opportunity, you know, the homes are always or should be sold in compliance with federal, state, and local anti-discrimination laws, uh, terms and conditions. So this offer is an offer to purchase the property with all the above terms and conditions. So this is just letting you know that everything is the way it's written in this contract. If you're, if that seller told your uh, buyer while they were there, I'm going to leave you the swing set and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. If it's not in this contract and they change their mind, then it, it doesn't count. So anything verbal, anything that was discussed prior does not count. So anything that that is of concern and matters to your clients needs to be in this contract or a, attached to an addendum. Uh, time of the essence, entire contract. So again, time is of the essence. And this is a part where a lot of agents don't understand that all, again, all under, um, understandings between the parties are incorporated in this agreement. And it, the dates are there for a reason. You know, the acceptance date is important. Your, you know, your contracted dates are important. You know, when contingencies are to be removed. And that's why I say, if you need more time, then ask for an extension. Once contract is coming to an you know, end or the day it, you, know, you thought you were going to close, send out another extension. You know, make sure you remain in contract. Otherwise, you're no longer in contract and you're out of compliance and they can cancel. And then let's see here real quick. Okay. Bye, Terry. <laughs>
Um, and then here, these are just some definitions that you guys can go through. Um, an expiration of offer. Now, typically, an, uh, an offer expires within three days. It says on the third day. But right now, we're not hearing back for sometimes a week or two. <laughs> so it's really up to you as a, a buyer if you want to keep your um, offer in play or not. So that's, again, up to you. Um, and then you're just going to have your buyer sign and execute where they need to. And uh, that's basically it. I mean, do you guys have any other questions or anything that you specifically about the contract that you want more information about? But that's basically the RPA in a nutshell. Let me go back here. Where am I at? Okay, here we go. Okay, let's see. I'm gonna try to see if I can unmute everybody. I don't know. How do I do this, Jessica? Uh, or cancel. Oh, oh wait, no. That's muting. Oh. Any questions? Everybody's good to go. Ready to go right up those offers, ready to kill it. <laughs> No questions? I have a question. Okay. Uh, I had a, a situation where I had a seller, a listing agent, who was not responding and was basically, in my opinion, out of contract for uh, just falling off the face of the earth with uh, her seller and responding with uh, signing documentation and re, you know, just re, just doing her job. And um, at that time we had a, um, I had a buyer and she was all in and we had agreed. And what happens when, I mean, I ended up calling her broker and um, I got some very, negative feedback about this uh this agent and what do you do at that time because we did have ten thousand dollars in the emd and you know at my i lost this buyer i lost the buyer even though we were able to recruit we uh recoup all her money and uh but it was really the seller the seller's uh listing agent and uh who who's at fault here so how do you how do you um, how do you get to the to that point of I mean we did the notice to perform we did two of them and we, you know I had to get involved with her escrow her escrow office who couldn't get a hold of her either how do you, how do you uh, you know look good <laughs> and not lose the buyer when you've done everything right I mean what is what what are I mean, do you just chalk it up to, oh, well, you know, it wasn't my fault. It was her fault. And, and um, I lost the buyer and she ended up buying with somebody else. And all because of this listing agent who did not perform and uh, did not do her job. And, and then I even had a call from the listing agents, um, the listing agents, buy, uh, buyer, uh, sellers, asking me about their agent and uh they they had a very they were not able to get anything any feedback from her as well so in their opinion we were still like way or they didn't they didn't get any of the documentation i sent for signature nothing 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 other than the the purchase agreement and we had, I mean, uh, submitted many documents and um, it, 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 I don't even know. It's just a, such a nightmare case, but I lost a really good buyer and I just don't, I, I heard what you said about, you know, you know, being careful with, you know, doing the notice to perform and, um, you know, making sure that the sell, everybody's in agreement to get the money back. The only reason we got our money back is because the escrow office that she chose did not 
was not able to uh, get a hold of her as well. They never even heard from back from her after they collected the EMD. Never, yeah. got, any, never got anything back from her. And so um, they sent out a letter to her if, uh, if you don't respond within 10 days, uh -huh. the attached letter that they were going to return the, um, the money. And that's what happened. We had to wait 10 days after all that to get their money back. And they got it back. But how, how do you protect yourself against You know what? It, I don't know all the facts. Um, so it, it's, you know, I, it, we would have to like look at everything. But if I get into contract and I see that the agent's not, which to me doesn't make any sense why the agent wouldn't perform because obviously they want to get paid too. So I have no idea why they wouldn't perform. But all, but ultimately the contract belongs to the broker. So by contacting the broker, the broker should have been able to, you know, proceed. Um, if not, um, I would have just contacted our attorney and forced them if that's what you wanted to do. I mean, I know Letty who's on the call, we kind of had a similar instance and we got Rod involved right away and they changed their tune quick, right? Letty was within 24 hours, they, they changed their tune. Um, yeah. So we'll, we'll involve Rod, that's what he's there for. Yeah. Um, to get him involved. Mm -hmm. But if, but sometimes it puts a bad taste in the mouth of the buyer. Like, I don't want to go, this is already bad energy. I don't even want this house anymore. So I think that us as agents just have to be um, transparent, communicating with our clients, letting them know, like, and I wouldn't be like, oh, this is not me. It's her. I wouldn't, that's not how I would communicate. I would just let them know, look at their standard procedures that need to be done. And she's not doing you know, we've done our part. It's her turn to do hers. And she, for whatever reason, there's a, you know, there's a, some type of, um, there's a disconnect somewhere. And I don't know if maybe something happened to her or I have no clue, but I, the next thing for me to do is to call, you know, her broker. And if her broker doesn't respond, you know, do you guys still want to proceed with this home or do you guys just want to just call it a day and let's go look for something else? Like I would give them the option. And if they're like, no, 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 we want to go for this house. Okay, then let me let me get my attorney involved. Then let me see what we have to do. That that's what I would, based on what you're telling me, that's kind of the direction I would have taken. And and I did. I got uh, Rod involved, and it, uh, Rod instructed me on how to proceed, and so we did. And uh, we even called the broker. The broker had very negative things to say about their agent, but did not. So did not uh, encourage moving forward with the, I, uh, the, yes, the person who answered the phone for the broker was a real estate agent who works for the broker. The broker would not get on the phone. So she relayed the information to the broker and the broker said he wasn't going to get involved. He, he didn't like this real estate agent. <laughs> That doesn't make any yeah, sense. I yeah, know, I know. And I'm like, you know, and I worked with this with a couple of my uh, colleagues from the North Montana office. And we were just like dumbfounded. We're like, how can a broker say all that? How could the agent say that? So what do we do? We, we want we were really hoping the broker was going to help us get this through and get and get to the end because the sellers really wanted to because they were contingent on a house that they were buying too. Yeah. So. Yeah, honestly, I really I can't I mean I don't have an answer for that, but I, that's it just goes back to you know, building a relationship with your client, making sure that they trust you, you know, so that way they stay in your corner, because a lot of times things that you're going to get all kinds of stuff thrown at you. And if there's no sense of like that, you know, that trust with you, then they're going to start questioning everything that happens and you, you're built, you know, you build fear. Um, and maybe you didn't do it intentionally, but a lot of times that, you know, that that's what starts happening, you know, to the buyer. So like I said, I'm, I'm not sure of the whole, the whole scenario, but Usually you can tell how your escrow is going to be uh, just in the beginning <laughs> when you're negotiating, you, you already know like, okay, this person doesn't respond. This person doesn't get back to me, you know, or this person is on top of it. This person's this and people don't change. They are who they are. And that's what it's going to be like, if not worse. So you, you can always let your client know that, you know, this, 
this agent has been really difficult to get a hold with, but we got, you know, to get a hold of, but we, we, you know, we got it done. So let's, we're going to have to be a little bit more patient with her because she just takes longer than most, but let's just get it done. So then that's already setting up the expectation, you know, for them as well. So without being negative, you know, yeah. we don't want to be negative. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyhow, well, sorry to hear that. Oh, no. but, yeah water under the bridge oh yeah does anyone have any other questions we're good all right you guys well thank you guys so much for joining and i will talk to you guys real soon have a great day